Hi, guys. Welcome to GR Rideshare Adventure Podcast. Thank you for joining us. We have another special episode up for this week uh, as we take some time off for holiday comings and goings and spending time with our family. Uh, we recorded this about a month ago. Uh, we did live stream it, so those around the live stream, uh, this will be a repeat. But uh, we sat down with rideshare driver David Freeman in the Grand Rapids area. He is a mechanic for his full-time gig at Christian Brothers Automotive Services in Grand Rapids and uh, also does rideshare driving for obvious reasons. Um, that's why we brought him on. So it's a good article, excuse me, a good podcast about, you know, some of the myths with, you know, changing your oil, brakes, and some of the things that he recommends to do to keep things running smooth. Um, like, you know, it's super important to have inflated tires and rotate your tires on a regular basis, etc. So check it out. Let me know what you think. Uh, please comment, subscribe, like, uh, all those things. We're on, obviously, you're listening to this, so I don't need to tell you what we're on. But uh, yeah, if you could share this with a friend uh, or rideshare driver that might need some help, uh, you know, with car mechanics or anything else rideshare related, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. All right, guys, welcome to, whoa, that was loud. Welcome to was. GR Rideshare Adventures. We are live tonight and recording, I did press record, hey. with uh, Ben and Jason and then David Freeman. He is a mechanic for uh, Christian Brothers. Yep. Um, and let's see, married, three boys, two dogs. What kind of dogs do you have? A uh, pit bull and a Staffordshire Terrier. A pit bull, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. Not as vicious as people think. Yeah, it's all how you train them, right? Or yep. raise them. Um, let's see. Worked for Christian Brothers for two and a half years. Um, so you've just basically been uh, working for cars for about 10 years, right? Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, so what this podcast is going to be about is just we finally have someone in here that can talk about maintenance. I mean, rideshare yeah. driving is one of the biggest things um, – uh, or maintenance is one of the biggest things for rideshare driving to, I mean, you're beating up your car constantly. And so we're kind of going to talk about that. So we're just going to got a list of questions. He's certified in everything. So he should be able to answer any questions that we have um, in regards to, uh, to maintenance. So first thing up is oil changes. You know, the old rule was every 3000 miles. Um, that's just what my dad told me, change mm-hmm. it every 3000 miles. Yep. Some people are saying 5,000 miles. Uh, what is your recommendation on that? Well, it does vary depending on the vehicle. Um, the 3,000 rule kind of came into effect with old technology where you had not as um, good a technology for refining the oil in the first place. Yeah. As well as engines that don't run as efficiently. Okay. And that's the biggest contrib- uh, contribution to um, oil wear is how well the engine's running. Okay. So now that you have more efficient vehicles, it puts less wear and tear on the oil. Okay. Combines the better refining, and it lasts a lot longer. Okay. The downside to that is um, all engines consume a small amount of oil. Um, most manufacturers will say if you lose a quart of oil in 1,500 miles, that's okay. Whoa. Um, really? really? By specification, they'll say that's okay. Wow. Um so if you extend that out to the 6,000 miles that a lot of cars will go before the uh, dash reminder will come on, yeah, you can easily be below the safe range on oil. So it's okay to go that long on oil change with the proper mm. oil, but you need to be checking your fluids. Really? Um, not just oil, but all your fluids you should be checking on a regular basis to make sure everything has what it needs to operate properly. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be honest. I don't check my oil in my. I mean, it's not a newer car. It's a 2010. It's got 157. Uh, I don't ever check the oil. I mean, I change my own oil, but I don't ever check the the levels on it. Um, and one of the other question is, are those onboard computers reliable? They are fairly reliable, but again, it goes back to you have as long as the level is good, it's not bad. Well, I mean, sure. as, as far as reliability is for um, the reminder like mm-hmm. mine goes like fifth it, it'll the little wrench comes on at 15 percent, and then 10 and 5 and then it's like then it starts minusing miles on there um 
Well, it does depend on the, what the vehicle is programmed to. Some are just based off of time or mileage. Some actually do a calculation based off of how hot the engine is running, if it's running a lot of uh, long-distance warm-up time or a lot of short drives that don't warm up all the way because it, that impacts oil life as well. Yeah, I've never really – that's a good question. I don't know how mine is set up. I've never really tracked the mileage. Usually it seems about 5K roughly. Oh. A lot of them are based off of mileage, and five or six k sounds about right, depending on. The okay, hmm. um, I do only run synthetic in my car. Um, is am I wasting money by doing that? I mean, I change it myself. I mean, in the winter, I don't because I don't have a place to crawl under. I'm not going to do it when it's freezing cold. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, that also depends on the vehicle. A lot of newer GM vehicles, a lot of European vehicles require synthetic, and even a lot of newer Fords and other vehicles now as well. Um, because if to gain the fuel economy requirements of federal government's requiring, mm-hmm. you have to have a um, lower viscosity oil t- tire tolerances on the engine. So to do that, they pretty much have to have synthetic. Mm. So that's one thing. If you if you have to have it, obviously you put the synthetic. Right. If you don't, um, it is a good idea. You can also go with a longer oil change and roll when you do that. Instead of doing three thousand, for example, you go up to like six thousand. As long as you're again checking the levels and keeping it full. Yeah, it's it's still kind of I still I want to know because I'm spending the money on that synthetic. Do I go by what my car says or I mean? There have been a number of studies that show the difference, and I've um, one that comes to mind in particular was done by uh, Mobile, and they use a fleet of the New York taxis with the mm. old Crown Vic engines, not engines that require synthetic by any means, but they did after seventy five. Thousand miles, uh, tear down on a bunch of them with synthetic and without synthetic, but everything else the same on as far as intervals. And there was a noticeable difference on the wear between the synthetic and non synthetic, okay. everything else being the same. Hmm. So it does help. Um, but yeah. if you want to spend that much or not, it's- well, the, that's the thing. If you do it yourself, I can get a filter and oil for like less than 35 bucks. But you go to Valvoline, they'll charge you 90 bucks for the same stuff. Um, that's just crazy. So I try to, in the winter time, I'll go with the synthetic blend at least, but I can't spend, I can't see spending $90 on a freaking oil change. Um, you know, they're charging an arm and a light or up charging it so much. I mean, it takes them 10 minutes to charge a $90 for a synthetic oil change. <laughs> um, which brings up a point about the filter. So they always change the filter at Valvoline. I bought a filter that says 20,000 miles on it. Hmm. Legit, I mean, it was not that expensive either, and I followed it. I would only change the oil. I, I have a, uh, an app called, it used to be called Gas Buddy, mm-hmm. but it's called Fuelly now. Fuelly. And I like the old one better, but whatever, they bought them out, and I've had it for seven, eight years since they got smartphones, and I love it. But it, I do. I do not change that filter until it hits 20,000 mm. miles. Is that good, bad, indifferent? Doesn't really make a difference. There are extended capacity filters on, on the market. I don't know what one you're using in particular, but yes. It's there. Fram. I don't care for Fram because I've seen them fail, personally. Okay. Um, but <laughs> Dang it. I like There those. you go. <laughs> but there are good extended capacity ones out on the market. Um, K&N makes one. They're not cheap, but. They are decent. really expensive. But there's a good reason for that. They right. make a good product. Um Mobile One has an extended capacity one as well. So there are some decent ones out there, but hmm. I, I avoid Fram at pretty much every cost. Really? So. Interesting. Do you know, honestly, why I like them the most? Because they have the grippy thing on the end of the of the filter. Oh, yeah. So, so that's easy nice. to pull out. Yeah. So you're, it is, yeah, that's exactly it. Because a lot of times, if I do it myself, I turn, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I put the filter on, and then I probably. I put it tight, and then I probably do a 180, one more just enough to snug it. Because you go to the oil change place, they ream that sucker on. I go to try to take the filter off from oil change place. I have to, like, basically, if you don't have the tool to get it out, this is so redneck. But I'll take a screwdriver and punch it through the filter just so I can get the leverage to turn it out like that. Um why do they put it? Do they just put it on tight to, to CYA so that it doesn't come loose? <laughs> That's part of it. Um, part of it also is, frankly, a lot of oil change places do not do as much training as they should. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so you get people who don't know as much as they probably should. Okay. Um, my dad too, too also said to, uh, 
take the oil and put a little bit around that rubber seal before you tie it in. I don't know why, but I do it. <laughs> it does help with removing it in the future, and if it's properly tor- uh, tightened down, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, and that's actually what the that's what the um, uh, procedure is to do on a filter. Okay. Uh, as far as the keep turning once it t- uh, touches the. Rule of thumb on that is supposed to be three quarter to uh, one full turn after uh, after it touches. Yep. Okay, so I might be a little light on it, but I've never had any issue with it. But guess what? When I go under there, because it kind of tightens itself as it drives, it, I feel like. Yeah. But I'm able to break it with my hand and not have to stick a screwdriver. <laughs> it's a mess too. What a hillbilly! I'm down there just jamming it through the plastic. That's I'm awesome. Like, hey, if you got to get it out, I mean, you, yeah. I mean, you got to get it out. There, okay. there are a lot of uh, jokes out there from mechanics about people who over tighten those things. So yeah, it's, it's not just you. Don't. <laughs> no, no, I don't over tighten. It's the dang oil change places. So is it true that at these instant oil change places, the people that work there are not necessarily ASE certified? Uh, most of them are not. In fact, very few are. Hmm. Um, at least in Michigan. Um, mechanics have to be certified by the state of Michigan, not necessarily ASE certified. But okay. uh, oil change. Um, quick change places do not require the same thing. Interesting. Um, because it's considered light maintenance. Yeah, they're not really fixing anything. Yeah. Um, they're yeah. just, yeah, I can, it would seem me kind of overqualified if you had that. Why are you working at Valvoline? I mean, nothing against Valvoline by any means, but. Yeah. Um, now, my, my first job at, as a tech was in a quick change type setting. So, okay. Um, it was at a dealership one, but. Sure. It was, it's not a bad place to start, but yeah, you, yeah, get your feet wet per se. Exactly. Yeah. So when you think about that, a lot of the people who work in quick change places have some mechanical aptitude, but not the training or level of knowledge to do everything. Yeah. Well, we've all—I swear—we've all have a friend that said that they got their t- oil change at an oil change place, and they got home and they didn't have any oil, and they ran out, and their <laughs> engine went. Psh. I mean, I don't know anyone personally, but I have read stuff on social yeah. media that like. I got home and my engine seized up. Whoops. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, and I'm sure it happens in other mechanic shops too, but I'm like, how do you forget the oil? Like out of all the things, <laughs> at least if you forget the plug, you put the oil in, it makes a mess. You're like, oh, okay, whoops. But you forget to put the oil in. <laughs> uh, I won't mention the name of the dealership. Yeah, don't. <laughs> but the, the one that I worked at did have an issue with Ooh. that where they had to buy an engine for someone. Ooh. Oh, man. That's a big mistake. Yes. Yeah. That's not it. It does happen, unfortunately. I mean, everyone is human and makes mistakes, but unfortunately, that was a very costly mistake. Yeah. Oh, no my kidding. gosh. So let's jump into tires a little bit. Yes. Can I jump in? Absolutely. Huh. Tires have been my nemesis lately. <laughs> um, I drive a Traverse, and I knew it was having some alignment issues because the wear pattern on the front tires was, it was rough. It, the sides of the tires were getting pretty bald but yet the rest of the tire had a lot of tread left on it so my first question is it safe to drive a vehicle that's (laughs) wearing awkwardly (laughs) well that does depend on how awkwardly i've seen some (laughs) tires wear out from new to like what you're describing in a few weeks on a in a really extreme case and that wouldn't be safe um if it's somewhere you're getting unusual wear over six thousand ten thousand miles it's probably safe, but it's not obviously cost effective. Not advisable either. Yeah. Um, but um, tire wear is a good indicator of if you have other issues. Well, yours were wearing weird. They were yes. wearing on the outside. Yeah. Because you had like what ball joint or strut issues? So it was odd. The weird wear was happening on the front tires, but a lot of the, the most of the issues were on the back tires. Um, which I'm not sure how that all works out, but needless to say, I put four new tires on, had ball joints and uh, a couple other things fixed back there and uh, spent a pretty penny on it. So tires are kind of a thing for me these days. So what can I do um, to prevent myself from being in that situation again? So I bought the car a year ago and when you buy a car used, should you just put new tires on it, or what do not, you think? Not no, no, um, unless it happens to need it, and then you should be paying less for the car. Yeah, right. But uh, to touch back on the safety issue for a second, you mentioned you had the worn ball joints. A lot of times, alignment 
tire wear issues will reveal that there is another problem and that could be safety related if a ball joint is so worn that it could come apart while driving or a tie rod as well and then potentially not have any steering so it could be safety in that regard mm-hmm. just i want to make sure i'm clear on that <laughs> but um going you lost my train of thought. that's okay no we we're talking tires and wear on the outside tires. Um, and you talked about rep- getting new tires um, if you bought a car, et cetera. Did I, did I help you? Yes, that jog my memory. Um, <laughs> it happens to us too. <laughs> so with um, buying a car and replacing tires, if there's a reason that you need to because of wear or whatever, then sure. But otherwise, not necessarily. Um, a good practice with any car is have uh, independent inspection done. Mm-hmm. A lot of shops would do that. I know we offer that at our shop. Um, typically, there'll be a, a small fee for it, but you consider that that will typically take about an hour of the te- a technician's time to go take it for a good test drive. Yeah. Um, experience any noticeable concerns. Put up in the air. Look for any loose components like a ball joint. Um, look at tire wear. Mm-hmm. Look at fluid levels. All that kind of thing. Um, and definitely advise that before buying any car. Yeah, that's invaluable to spend, what is it, like 50 bucks? Something Typically like, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's so worth it because if you see some, I mean, you're going to, yeah, you're not going to see all the nooks and crannies, but you're going to see a major problem. You're going to be like, ooh, ooh, I yeah. don't know about this. Yeah. Like you may go back to the salesman and say, uh-uh, or I wouldn't buy this. And yep. No, we do the same thing with our cars. We we have them inspected. So hmm. um, so some tips for prolonging. I know one of them, and, and I've been a victim of this, is the tire rotation. I do it every 6,000 miles. I don't know if that's overkill or not, but if you don't do that, you're done. I mean, those tires will last not very long. And I've been burned on that because I got lazy and didn't do it. 6,000 miles is about right. That's why I run on my own vehicles is 6,000 miles. Um, So the big things to look at for prolonging tire life, one is the rotation. The biggest one is proper inflation. Oh, Um, I don't do that very well. Yeah, a lot of people don't. I, I'm not as good <laughs> at this as I should be, especially as a technician. Yeah. But the thing that a lot of people don't realize is if you look at the sidewall, there's a, we'll say, maximum pressure, usually 45 pounds, yeah. 50 pounds, something like that. That's not what you want to inflate it for. If you look mm. in the door frame, usually, or on the uh, door itself. Yeah, there's the a little driver, sticker. Yep. And usually it will say something like 30 pounds, 35 pounds, 36 pounds. That's what you want to set it for is okay. what's in that placard on the door uh and sometimes it's not in the door uh, some older jeeps i know have in the glove box some vws and audis will put it in the fuel filler door for some reason interesting uh, but wherever it is that's what you want to look for what the vehicle manufacturer says to put the tire pressure in. and you want to fill those when they're cold right yes yeah because they inflate they get more pressure in there when they're hot yep i did know that yeah any other tips for prolonging tire life at all? Uh, we touched on a bit with alignment and making sure everything is tight in the um, suspension, that you don't have a worn bushing or a ball joint or tie rod. Um, those are the big three things is the rotation, the pressure, and uh, that nothing is worn or out of alignment. Here's a, here's a question for you. How do you rotate those tires? So <laughs> back in the day, it was a, a diagonal swap, right? So right, right front to left rear and then vice versa. It depends on the vehicle. Right. If you have a rear-wheel drive vehicle, like a truck, typically mm-hmm. what you'll do is um, do a crisscross on the ones that end up on the rear. Okay. Basically, whatever axle actually moves the vehicle regularly, you swap side to side as well as front to back at the same time. And oh. the other ones, you just sw- switch front to back. Okay. It, that's kind of the quick summary of it. But again, that's one of those things that you – should reference what the dealer, what the uh, manufacturer recommends. So, what about all-wheel drive? Technically, the best way to do that is do an X pattern uh, switch side side and front to back both time, both front and rear both times. Oh, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just put the fronts to the back and the backs to the fronts. Uh, so, there you go. Um, well, that's still better than nothing. But yeah. yeah, no kidding. So you're saying you you should switch them so you so the right rear should go. On the left, no. How are you saying? How are you saying that? You did depends the on what X. vehicle you're talking about. Your honor. All wheel <laughs> drive because that's I'm yeah. basing on my car because okay. that's what I have in all wheel so drive. So left car. rear tire would then go to front right, correct, and then front left would go to rear right. 
Correct. Yeah, so cross, yeah. like an X. An X. Yes. I thought you gave two steps, like an X plus this. And I was like, wait. Just an X. It is, it's kind of complicated to explain. It's yeah, because that's why. I w- see a diagram of it. So. Yeah, so just think of it as an X pattern. Yeah. Okay. Not just side to side, front to back. Well, that's harder for me when I do it myself because then you have to, then you have to prop the whole car up to yeah. do that because normally when you just i do it at uh my shop or i do lawn fertilization i'll just pump up one side and mm-hmm. then just swap them front to back bring it down do the other side oh boy i have to <laughs> bring it to discount tire or something to there do that go. so one thing that bell tire offered me when i got my new set of tires was the free alignment program that jason was like why would you do that is that necessary or is that just a marketing ploy what are your thoughts um on that and the quote-unquote tire warranty that you're paying extra for yeah tire warranty is not a bad idea a lot of people do have issues with you hit a nail on the road or whatever and yeah you replace it so that's not a bad idea as long as they're not charging some ridiculous amount but i also, think it's like 12 dollars a tire yeah, at it discount was not bad at it's, all it's usually not bad i i personally have used that before from discount okay um in the past um because. Yeah, I benefited from it too. I mean, I had a tire that blew out. I would have had to shell out the money for it, but it was covered. So I mean, that has its benefit. And the thing about tires is, honestly, there's not much profit for most shops to do it. So it's pretty hmm. competitive pricing. Hmm. Um, so, the, but um, doing the warranty is not a bad idea if they offer it. Um, the alignment. I'm not familiar with all the terms of that. Is something is that something you pay extra to get? Out of, Oh yeah, yeah. So when you, it's just like the warranty on your tires. It's a warranty on your alignment. Mm-hmm. So for an X amount period of time, you can just bring it in, and they'll do an alignment for you. So I don't. I've never got uh, the reason I kind of scoffed at it because I've never got my front end aligned. It's never well, other than when I wrecked the front end and yeah, it, you know eight thousand dollars of the damage they put an alignment on it. But I've never regularly like in my little fuelly app. It doesn't say oh time to get an alignment. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how important that is. I guess if your tires are wearing, and the the tire place says, "Hey, your tires are wearing really uneven." Okay, that's a red flag. But. Yeah. Typically, your alignment won't go out unless it's something worn out or mm. damaged from an impact. Oh yeah, that makes sense. But when that happens, you should be a notice that instead of your wheel being pretty level um, across the spokes, and you, every vehicle is different on what the spokes are aligned, but you'll right. know what is straight ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If it's not going straight ahead when you're going straight on most roads. Then you probably have something that's worn or needs to be replaced. Sure. Okay. Um, but with, I imagine with the um, alignment program, they don't cover worn components. They just cover doing the actual adjustment. The alignment. Yep. But if something's worn, they can't <coughs> do that anyway. Exactly. And alignments aren't terribly expensive. Usually. Well, I think what it is is to get you in the door. And if there's something else wrong, yeah, you're gonna go. Some there. people had some terrible experiences with Bell Tire with the inspection. I I mean, my car was relatively new, but they're like, oh, yeah, they said this, 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 and was wrong. And I'm like, but, I mean, if it is, that's why they're doing the inspection for free. They, they're they trying to upsell. I mean, if it legitimately is wrong, then you probably should get it fixed. But I've never had a problem with Bell Tire. They've always approved me, mm-hmm. even with my wife's van, which is quite a bit older. They're like, yeah, it's good. So I can't speak from experience on that. I've heard some rumors, but... I'm always hesitant to go off of someone else's rumor yeah. because I don't know. And each, you know, each bell tire is different. There's a, you know, there's probably eight of them in the city. And so I went to the one in Granville. I didn't have any problem, mm-hmm. but so ride share driving, we all three of us do it. This is a ride share podcast. Do you, what do you, what are the biggest mistakes you think a ride share driver makes? Obviously I think just neglect. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> Mr. Neglectful. Yeah. For those who aren't watching, he's being pat on the back over here. <laughs> <laughs> but neglect in general, yes. Uh, not checking fluid levels with the oil change. Which I don't do. I honestly... Oh, with the oil change, you said? Well, with the oil um, levels, like I was talking about earlier for one thing, but fluids in general, not maintaining the fluid levels and not maintaining tire pressure. Okay. Would be the... Uh, not just ride share, but drivers in general. Those are the things that people neglect the most is just keeping an eye on it. Hmm. And the thing about it is if you have a good shop that you have a relationship with, most of them will be happy to check your fluid level and make sure that you're a good place even between changes. Yeah. Just swing by and someone, even if it's just an advisor, will know enough to go run out real quick and say, oh yeah, your oil level's fine. Or no, you need to get 
let's take a look inside real quick. Yeah. Uh, um, because most of us in the field of mechanics don't want you to have problems with your cars. We want to maintain them in good order. Right. Mm. Be more maintenance than sure. And then uh, catastrophic catastrophic failure. Yeah. No one obviously. I mean, you probably, as far as your business goes, do you know how much you your business is from maintenance and actual repairs? Do you know the numbers? Because I bet it's more repairs because people are terrible with maintenance. Yeah, because typically people don't bring cars in until until there's a problem. Yeah, except for and that actually goes back to one thing I wanted to mention about the oil changes with the three thousand miles versus now the six thousand miles. Uh, one nice thing about the sort of changes is it is another opportunity for the car to come in on the lift, and that's to make sure it's safe for you. Right. Because at least at our shop and a lot of shops, when we do the oil change, we make sure nothing is loose in the steering and right. there's nothing glaring safety issue or major fluid leak or some other problem that's going to leave you stranded or otherwise having a bigger problem down the road. And the bottom line is to find a shop that you trust because, you know, you go in there for an oil change, like I talked about the Bell Tire. I mean, they're like, oh, yeah, you need this, this, this. We don't know. We're not mechanics. You got to trust the person you're going to. Otherwise, they could take advantage of you. I I'm, I hate to say that, but I wanted to bring up the OBD scanners because I actually have an issue going on right now. Happened about three days ago. My engine light went on and the D started blinking in um, on my car. I have a 2010 Honda Pilot. And, of course, I Googled it, and it says something with the transmission, probably a sensor that went bad. That light went off. It's supposed to go in the shop on Monday to the actual Honda dealership. I don't recommend dealerships just because I feel like they charge a little more, but I have an airbag recall, so they're going to look at it. There you go. Is there a history in that OBD where they can see that that went off and still repair it from that? Because a lot of times I feel you bring it in, they're like, oh, that's it's not causing a problem anymore. I can't fix it if I can't diagnose it. There's a bit of yes and no to that. <laughs> um, Dang it. Yeah. <laughs> With... OBD2, which is 96 and newer, it should have the code stored in a memory on the computer. Okay. So at least give a place to look at and say, okay, this is a system to look at where it might be that. And then maybe do some more testing to narrow down what the problem is. Okay. Um, but if it won't act up while it's at the shop, the options are then, well, it's probably this we can guess and throw a part at it, but that may not fix it. Or we can say, well, we can't verify it right now, so... Well, if the history says, because I'm assuming when they look at it, it's going to say it's this sensor is bad. It's touchy. Yes. But with any code on there, it's like if you go to a doctor and say, yeah, my stomach's sick. Okay. Okay. Well, they could just say, take some pepto bismol. That might fix it, but maybe Pepto won't help you. Okay. Uh, the codes only say what part to look at. It doesn't tell you what is it's causing, causing that. It okay. could be the sensor. It could be the wiring. It could be whatever the sensor is reading isn't. So my guess on up. Monday when I call them, if I ask them to replace it, they probably will. But, I mean, I I noticed a significant difference on the shifting. Mm -hmm. It was on the high end. So it shifted all the way fine. But then when I was around 70, I could the RPMs were a lot higher. Not super high, but they were like at 3,000 or a little touch less when they should have been at like 2,200 at 70 miles an hour. So I don't know. And then it just went away. And I, I've driven the last three days, ride chair driving and whatever, and it hasn't been an issue. So I think I wanted this I because I it's such a pain to, to get your car in. You need your car for just get to work and everything. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of feel like I want to just tell them to fix it. But I guess that part's not that expensive from when I looked at it. But And it sounds like what you're looking at something that's uh, fairly common for that symptom. And, and yes. it very well might be that. Yeah. But there's always a risk that that isn't that. And they probably would say, if you, we, we can replace the sensor that it says, but it may not be the main issue. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious. Um, the, I guess the actual question was, do OBD scanners that you can buy actually work? I mean, I'm sure mm -hmm. there's different levels of just like quality of anything. That's like what I was saying a moment ago about the, okay, doctor, my stomach's sick. What, right. Give me some pep. That may or may not fix it. Like right. If you have, say, a misfire is a pretty common uh, concern where it will set a code for the engine not firing off the spark plug the way it's supposed to. Right. Well, it could be a spark plug. It could be. 
uh, the wires of it. The car has it. it. Could be ignition coil. Could be not getting fuel because of a bad injector. Could just not be getting fuel at all. Yeah. It might not be getting enough air. It might be getting too much air. <laughs> all these based yeah. off that one code will tell you there's a problem that it's having, but it oh, won't okay. tell you which so, problem it so, is. Okay, I understand. So it tells you you have a problem, but it doesn't tell you the symptoms why it's do, why it's throwing that code. Exactly. Oof. So that's where, sure, the cheap scanners or AutoZone can give you a direction to look at, but okay. it doesn't give you the full answer. Okay. All right. Dang it. Because <laughs> I don't want to bring my car in again. I'm like, I need my car. Like, that's ugh, it's annoying. Um, let's see. Um, winter tires. You know, a lot of those shops push them. The only thing I know about them is that if they're not on ice or snow, they wear down really quick. Is that false myth? No, that's pretty much true. <laughs> um, the thing about winter tires Versus an all-season tire. And most cars come stock of all-season tires. Yeah, that's what I put on. Yep. Uh, the all-season tires make a very good balanced tire to go all year round. However, um, once you start getting colder temperatures, the winter tires have a softer compound that allows it to um, get better spread out on the tra- on the surface of the oh, road. Okay. So it will get better traction on ice. They also have a different tread design, so they'll get more places to get traction on the ice. And so there is a significant difference with uh, the traction you get off of a snow tire. Now you still have to drive for the conditions. If you are slamming on brakes on ice, there's still only so much the tire <laughs> yeah, can do. Right. But they do improve it substantially. Um, the flip side with you're saying with the warrior is if you get above about 45 degrees, that softer compound will wear very quickly. Okay. So that's why they are winter and not all season. Um, yeah. And then there are a number of good winter tires out there. Um, uh, Bridgestone makes some excellent ones. Uh, Nokian is a really good brand for that. But do you think it's really worth it? Because like discount, they they say that. Um, I only know of discount because that's pretty much the only tire plates I've ever used. So um, they say that they'll store your summer ones for you if you buy the the winter ones, you know, and then vice versa. I just wonder if it's worth. I mean, because you're gonna drop another seven to seven hundred to a thousand dollars for a set of snow tires that you might you know you only use half the year and then if it gets warm if you have a warm winter then you're wearing them down like crazy so i just wonder mm-hmm. if it's even worth it true but then you're also putting less wear and tear on your summer tires at the same time that's true so overall you're still getting the roughly same amount of time out of the tires it just goes on a longer period of time that's true so there's that to consider there's storage to consider discount does do storage program some other places do storage program interesting but I'd like to try it because, I mean, I feel like my tires are okay, but I'd be interested to try. I've never owned a car that had snow tires. Hmm. The other option is uh, they're they're starting to do some improved compounds that are decent all year round. Mm -hmm. What I actually have on my um, van at the moment are Nokian WR3s. Mm -hmm. If you look at them from a distance, they look like a snow tire. Hmm. Treads the same. Um, The compound seems a lot like it, but it's – okay to run them all year they don't have the same tread wear as you still rate as a fifty thousand mile tire which is not bad no, yeah not. that is good now a good all season tire you might be able to get a seventy thousand mile but still fifty thousand miles for one set of tire that you don't have to switch year yeah. to year is not bad <clears throat> if you don't have a place to store especially yeah yeah i might look into it next year I'm- well with those ratings of miles on tires so i work in the copier and printer industry and we Hashtag printer yeah and on our on our toners we always say it has you know, this much yield, um, it'll give you 15,000 pages, but that's only if you're running like 5% volume on a page. If you're running 20%, you're not going to get that yield. So knowing that about my industry, how is it with tires? Can you actually get the 50, 60, 70, whatever the guarantee is? Are you going to see that kind of mileage out of your tires? I I have seen it on vehicles that are properly rotated. Like <laughs> there it hornets. is. Yep. <laughs> yeah, very good. So, so rotate and, your tires. And keep them inflated. Yeah, I mean, you just got a new set of tires. Yeah. I want them suckers lasting a long time. I absolutely, you do, I do. <laughs> and driving style also plays, plays a factor in that as well. If yeah. you're uh, favoring that right-hand pedal there a little bit, you might have a little <laughs> bit more problem keeping your tires in good condition. A um, couple other things. Question is, how do you tell when your brake pads and rotors are starting to need to be replaced? 
personal story with that. It feels like the cars nowadays, the second you hear a little bit of noise, it's like too late. It used to be like a warning where you'd be like, oh, okay, I should get it. But I've gone to like, it starts squealing. And then all of a sudden my rotor shot because, you know, I went two weeks without replacing it. There's just not enough warning, I feel personally, but. That one's really hard to say because a lot of it does depend on driving style as well. I mean, it and probably depends on uh, um, pad or, mm-hmm. or what you buy. That also has an impact. Um, and again, if something else is wrong or not, because True. if the brakes are all working properly and just worn out, then you have a little more warning. If they're wearing out because something's not moving properly, so it's holding that brake on a little bit, yeah, it can wear that out in no time flat. Yeah. So, but yeah, you do get the squeal indicator. Um, and the other thing is, again, this goes back to uh, having that regular inspection with other maintenance is uh, a good shop will inspect the brakes. Even if not by taking off the wheels, you can at least do a visual inspection through the uh, spokes on the wheels. Uh, if you're doing a rotation, it's a great opportunity to go ahead and look at the pads and say, yeah, you have about half your pad life yet. You have 25% left. Yeah. Eh, you might want to look at you about 10% and just get a general idea, even if not exact okay. measurements. All right. Um, reliable vehicles, in your opinion, for Nick has for rideshare driving, but in general, what I mean. I should just ask what you drive because that's probably <laughs> what you think is reliable. Not necessarily, but. Well, what I drive is an old Jeep and a Dodge Caravan. Okay. So um, I think Caravan makes a good ride share vehicle overall, although it's not one of the cheapest to maintain. They, are, they are a pretty reliable vehicle overall. Um, and there's a lot of them on the road, but they give you the XL capacity, mm-hmm. decent on fuel, overall fairly reliable what kind of gas mileage do you get uh with mixed driving around 18 17 depending on time of year sure um that and the fact that no one who drives it is exactly slow (laughs) (laughs) 18 17 that doesn't seem that good because i get i average 16.9 in my pilot and that this thing seems a a beast you know what i mean and that's average between city and highway driving but I thought the van would get more in the the twenties, because what? Well, depending, I mean, how old mixed, it is. Well, it's a that one's an 07, and it's like I said, mixed driving, but the majority is city. Yeah, so that doesn't help. That makes a big right. difference, right? And it also probably should be getting a little bit better fuel economy than it does, but yeah, um, it it's never been noted as the most fuel economic vehicle. I've what <laughs> that which brings up a good point. My wife's car. It's thrown the engine light for, I don't know, 100,000 miles to get that stupid catalytic converter uh, fixed. I think that's what it is. The How much are we actually losing on efficiency by not getting that fixed? Because it's like 800 bucks to get it fixed because those are, are so expensive. The cat failure codes don't necessarily mean your car isn't running efficiently. Oh, okay. Um that means it's not cleaning up the exhaust emissions efficiently. Or maybe that's not what we were talking about. Maybe it's the fuel filter or it's something, but... Evaporative emission system, perhaps? Could be. Um, I don't know. I just know it's been on for 100,000 miles. And when I when they told me what it was, it was going to be like 800 to get fixed just to get the light off. And I was like, I can just deal with the light. That's <laughs> probably a cat. That sounds about right, depending on... The catalytic yeah. converter. Yeah, because it's the metal in there that makes them so expensive, right? Yep. It wasn't the rep- it wasn't the labor. It was just the part was ridiculous. Yeah, so. it, it has precious metals inside that are very expensive. Yeah, dumb freaking liberals <laughs> <laughs> trying to make it more efficient. Wow, fuel efficient. Sorry, Ben. I'm not. A, uh, <laughs> I don't get into politics on this. No. Podcast. Um, a couple more things we talked about rotating. Uh, gasoline. Let's talk about the gasoline. I know you brought that up before we started. Um, that make a big difference. I thought it was pretty simple, but you're like, no, let's talk about it. Why is that? So, I mean, obviously always follow your manufacturers, but I think what the question that people might ask is if, if I use a higher octane in my, my pilot, let's say, is it going to make it run better? No, probably not. No, you just Um, wasted money, right? Pretty much. They like to put the terms premium or mid-grade or whatever on. yeah but yeah realistically speaking the what octane measurement is is how much does the fuel resist um firing off too early in the engine cycle 
So if it fires off too early, you're actually potentially damaging the engine um, and then causing it to work harder than it should. Yeah. Uh, and on older cars, that's where you get what's called spark knock. Um, so it would make a knocking noise. Modern cars have sensors on it and can change the timing on enough that it usually won't knock. Yeah. But it will reduce the efficiency of it. Mm. So then you're just paying more money to run less efficiently. <laughs> really stupid. Exactly. <laughs> So that's why you want to look at what your vehicle runs best right. on. And the engineers at GM or Honda or whatever probably know a lot better about that than whatever marketing person at Shell wants to say. Right. That's true. Um, I know I get a lot of my fuel at Costco, and it says it's like a top-tier gasoline. Uh, well, top-tier is separate from octane rating. Yeah, I top, know. Top Talk. T- do you know about that? Basically, that refers to how – um, higher quality of the cl- of the refining is okay. They just so are like, a little stricter. Yes, so okay. it means it's clean. It doesn't have a lot of extra sediment in it or anything else like that. Okay, so it means it's a good quality. But really, most everywhere you go is going to have top tier fuel. Okay, I go didn't to, know. Go to Marathon, Mobile, anywhere. They're pretty much going to be top tier. Okay. They um, just kind of put it right on their pumps. I don't know what's going on with these lights, guys. Sorry. It's like a strobe in here. It's, it's a party. You, sometimes it does it, but then it stops, but it's going hardcore tonight. Are you an electrician too? Well, I do a lot of electrical work <laughs> on cars. I have yeah. This house is weird. It's built in the 60s, and every once in a while it does it, and I got to get my buddy over. He He's done some electric work, and he's like, ugh. What is this? <laughs> like, so that's what scares me about bringing them over here. I don't need to spend uh, four hours trying to track it down. But, um, okay. So, yeah, Costco brags about that top. Well, it's on their pumps, and I look at the pump while I'm pumping gas. So, um, well, here's a good one. What, we see this a lot. What happens to your vehicle when you overload it with passengers? Is yeah. it really that bad? We see on the on the the national groups are like, yeah, I really picked up this fat ass and he wrecked my struts. I'm like, really? Mm, that's pretty unlikely. I mean, unless they're like barely making it already, and then you add <laughs> three four hundred pound guys, maybe. But I, how rarely that would be, happen? I don't see that as being a significant issue now i mean yeah you probably are getting less gas mileage on that trip i mean that's just physics you know what i mean but i can't believe um that would cause an issue (laughs) i I won't i wouldn't say that's probably a a significant issue for most people and how often you know speaking of that i've never done really alignment how often i mean will i get a better ride if i change my is it the shocks or the struts or or whatever you know? You see Monroe. Monroe is the big name for those. Um, is it worth upgrading to nicer ones where you get a better ride? Uh, well, most of them aren't going to give you a better ride. Particularly, it, it it's more of a safety issue, I and mean, this can go back to tire wear as well. Where uh, one that's not working efficiently will cause a tire to bounce a little bit on the ground. Yeah, and, and cause the tire to wear in a choppy pattern, kind of like waves. Okay, hmm. um, which makes sense. Yep. Yeah. And so not only does that cause tire wear, but when it's bouncing, that means it's not touching the ground, which means it's not getting contact for braking and steering. Yeah. So it is a safety issue. Um, and um, I want to say something like 80% of vehicles go to the junkyard with the original st- shocks and struts. Oh, okay. That makes sense because, like, I've never replaced them. My van's got 207,000. I bring should- it in my mechanic. They don't tell me to fix them. It wouldn't be bad to do it because even if they aren't leaking, which is one way to tell if, oh, if they okay. have a failure is if they're leaking, hmm. they might be uh, – there's valves inside that are usually rubber seals those and springs. And so those wear out over time. So it, yeah. gets, it may not be leaking outside, but it's still letting it move more than it should inside. That's a good point because that's a lot of miles on one part. You know, yeah. it seems like some things – we just had another repair, speaking of – just last week, the alternator went out, but it went two hundred seven thousand miles on That's that alternator. Awesome. That wasn't cheap either. Hmm. The alternator was like two hundred fifty bucks just for the part. Hmm. Yeah, <sighs> I hate spending money on cars. What That's do you got, true. buddy? I don't like it either, and I have to. I'm the one doing the work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're only buying the parts, though. <laughs> well, um, one of the common things you hear about mechanics stereotypes <laughs> is they're just out for your money. Um. You know, we've probably had experiences where we brought our car in for an issue to be fixed. And for whatever reason, 
the mechanic, quote, did not fix the issue. It's still happening. So let's say that happens, and you can pick the issue. But um, you bring your car in, you get the work done, <laughs> you get it home. It On the way home, it's running fine. But then a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, you're seeing the issue come back. What's your best course of action there? Do you recommend taking it to the shop that did the original work? Or would you recommend getting a second opinion by going to a different mechanic? What are your thoughts? I would recommend going back to the shop that did the work originally. Um, a good shop will say that they're not going to charge for the additional diagnostic and take care of it if it is related to what they did. And it may be that they did everything right, but mm-hmm. the part was effective. Uh, I mean, even think about new cars, they have a warranty for a reason. Yeah. It's because even with the new cars, there are problems. Mm-hmm. So um, I would definitely give the shop the chance to make it right. Um, now, the other thing with that is sometimes the issue could be something intermittent. We were talking about that earlier with your transmission. Yeah. Or it could be that there are a couple things going on. For example, maybe you hear a noise. Mm-hmm. And you describe the noise and you think, oh, it's going to be clear what it is. But you drive that car every day. So it's unusual to you because you recognize You know that, oh, I hate noises. Yes. Yeah. But then mechanic gets in it and doesn't know what's normal and what's not normal on that car. Hmm. Here's a different noise. Yeah. He says, oh, here's this noise over here. I'm going to fix that because that sounds like what you're describing. He fixes that. They get in it. And it may very well be a problem. It may be a bigger problem. Right. But it's not what you want to fix. (laughs) So in a situation like that, for example, it might be good to go back to the shop and say, look, this is still doing this. Can I go for a ride with a technician or right. with an advisor so you can hear or experience what I'm experiencing? Yeah. So we're all on the same page. Right. And then maybe that might clear it up and then be able to take care of it. And a lot of shops will then say, okay, since this wasn't even what we went after the first place, we'll work with you and – try and at least give you as much discount as we can. Yeah. I mean, they still have to charge if they're going to fix something else. I mean, they still have to pay their bills. So I think most people understand that, but there's nothing more frustrating than noises in a car. Like, cause you drive that car every day, thousands of miles. And you're like, all of a sudden you hear a noise. You're like, okay, where is it coming from? (laughs) I hate it. And as a technician, I get a car and I think I fix it. I take pride in that. Yeah. I don't want it to be fixed. Right. I don't want it to be a problem and have the customer dissatisfied with that. Yeah. So there have been times when this situation has played out with me. Yeah. And I'll just be like, I don't care about the time I'm figuring out. I'm just going to figure it out yeah, and I w- tell you what the problem because is. Because I want to figure it out. It. Yeah. I want to repair this. No, I'm, I'm glad you take pride in it because that makes me want to come to you and say, I know you're going to find this. I know you want to fix this. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> do you have um, any... Sorry. Go ahead. I was no, going to ask if you had any more questions. I was just going to throw this out there as an opportunity for you to talk a little bit about the shop you work for. Yeah. Um, what sets Christian Brothers apart from you know the other mechanics in town? Uh, well, one of the one thing is the pride. We definitely take pride in doing it properly, mm-hmm. and um, we will if in a situation like warranty, for example, we'll make yeah. sure it's right. Uh, we want to treat you as um, generally treat you as we would for any family or friend and not, I mean, it sounds kind of cliche, but the truth of the matter is that's what, no, it's not. I mean, a lot of mechanic shops, I've gone to Rosewood auto for many years. My dad did. In fact, the owner just passed away about two weeks ago. Um, his son is, um, there, but, um, but some shops you go to, you're just like, I mean, I get it. A shop is dirty. But when I walk into the lobby, although Rosewood Auto, the lobby was just a dump too, but I don't know. I mean, I guess that's good or bad. You might think that's a good mechanic because he doesn't spend a lot of money on the lobby. But um, some of those shops you walk into, you're like, do you have a little pride in your work? Like, I only went to Rosewood because my dad's like, they're awesome, you know, because of recommendation. Sure. But I feel like Christian Brothers, there's one. Uh, do you work on the one in Kalamazoo in 28th? Is yes. that? Okay. And uh, there are three in the area at the moment. The, yeah, where are the other ones? I've never drove past them. Uh, there's another one on 28th by the Cascade Meyer at yeah. 96. Yep. That one is pretty new. Uh, same owner. Um, and that one has been open since, I don't know, like nine months. Okay. Uh, I don't know the exact. Oh, so really new. It's, it's pretty new. It's new, yes. 28th and Cascade. Hmm. Uh, right in front of Meyer, same parking yep. lot. Um, there's a Verizon store. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Man, 
the, their signs usually stand out. I have clearly not looked at it. I <laughs> just was over there picking somebody up too. Yeah. And there's another one in Holland that's a different owner. Um, okay. Christian Barrels is actually a chain that has uh, about 190 stores around the country now. Holy oh, really? cow. I didn't know that. The, I've never even heard of them other than the one on 28th yeah. at Kalamazoo. Well, they're from Texas. Okay. Uh, so spread out from there, but now all around the country. Hmm. Um, and the store I'm at has been there, I believe, seven years now. Okay. And uh, that was number 88. So in the last seven years, I've been Whoa. Stores. That's crazy. <laughs> um. Yeah, so they're not – is it just the last name Christian? Uh, it's, it was started by some guys at a church that went to a Bible study together. And uh, they, wanted, they wanted to have a shop that treated people properly. And, okay, I was wondering if it was re- somewhat religion-based or if that th- was their last name. So, it, it, Well, it did form out of a Bible study group, but it's not specifically a Christian organization <laughs> yeah, either. Sure. Uh, right. We, I've worked with guys who are – atheist and even all over the spectrum on religion there so it's not like that's what they are well it's interesting but. kind of like chick-fil-a i yep. mean christian chicken it, christian <laughs> chicken but i'm sure all the owners are not and maybe they are christian i don't know but i mean i know they don't they're not open on sunday none mm-hmm. of them are but it's kind of the same thing it's based on you know that but no that's uh i'll have to get in there and take a look i know the the storefront looks really nice yeah. um so stop on by. Speaking of which, um, one thing I've been talking with the owner a little bit about is we're offering a 10% parts and labor discount to rideshare drivers. Okay. Awesome. Uh, that's for our two locations. Um, and we're just rolling that out. So, um, it's uh, a couple details might still be work tweaked on that, but yeah, let us know when it's officially and we can, you know, talk about we'll that. that. So, for sure. um, and that's, that's for maintenance too. Like, it's for everything except tires with a well, limit of seventy five dollars. Okay. So I mean, if you spend seven hundred fifty dollars, you save seventy five bucks. Yeah. But no, that's that, fair. We, no, I mean, I even go into I think it's AutoZone and you save ten percent with that code. I'm like, everything I buy there, I use the code. I mean, if you can save three bucks, who cares? Yeah. I mean, it's like free money. Yeah, like, why well, would well. you, might as well? I mean, I'm not a super tightwad, but I'm going to save if I have a coupon. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> like Groupon for the tree, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> is there anything else you, you want to leave us that you really want to talk about? Or um, I know I skipped over a few things, but um, that you think it's important, like leave us with like two amazing mm-hmm. things or maybe some things that we should, other than tire rotation and yeah. <laughs> pressure, which and I need checks. to do and fluid checks. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. My wife's car randomly was like leaking oil for a while on the driveway and I checked it and it was down and I added it and then it stopped. Hmm. That's weird. That is a bit weird. Yeah. It's not leaking anymore. Hmm. <laughs> Unless I'm not seeing it right. Cause I went for like three weeks checking it once a week. Levels were fine. Figure that out. Come on, mechanic. <laughs> Why is it doing that? I'd probably have to look at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but as far as anything else, nothing really comes to mind. I, I think we pretty much touched on, uh, everything we were kind of wanting to touch on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so the big takeaway for me is don't neglect stuff before, it, because if I were to address the alignment issue before it got really bad, yeah. I probably would have saved myself some money. At least you would have gotten more life on the tires and you could exactly. have delayed the tires. But I remember something, the air filter. Oh, yeah. So I'm a stickler. It says 12,000 miles on my car. I buy one. Now, I just did mine. I took it out. It was pretty dirty, but I mean, not cl- – well, it was pretty dirty. Is that really a huge benefit? I mean – It depends on, I mean, how dirty you're talking about, but – I mean, it was a lot, dirty. A lot of times the 12,000-mile thing, if you look at the factory schedules, it will say – um check every 12,000. So it may not necessarily need it at that point. Okay. But think of it this way. If you have a scarf in the winter and you put it over your mouth, Mm -hmm. you can breathe, but it's harder. Mm. So once you have that filter that gets dirtier, yeah, then it works, but it's working harder to do. Everything's working harder. That makes, that's a good. So it may not be a huge difference, but it's something. And I just, for, I just, for some reason, when it goes off $20, I get a new filter. I throw it in there. I mean, but it's probably not saving me on gas miles. I know they, you know, was it you that talked about the oil chain places? They try to, 
oh, you know, you're going to save two or three miles per gallon by doing this and that. So they, I feel like they pressure you into doing that. And I just kind of be like, you know, this is 12,000. That's what I recommend or whatever, checking it. This is when I replace it. And to me, 20 bucks, I mean, yeah. when's the last time you changed your air filter? When I got my oil changed last. How dirty was it? Oh, do you want to talk about the transmission fluid? <laughs> no. He looked at Ben, so. Yeah. Speaking of neglect, I am, it's a good thing I'm here tonight. It's yeah. Been very he's, educational. You need to get, stay on this boy. It's really bad that one of my friends from college is a mechanic. Yeah. <laughs> and you're terrible with it. <laughs> like, really you have bad ev- with my car. You have every opportunity to be like, dude, what, what should I do? I'll send him messages and I'll be like, what do I need to do? And he'll tell me and I just don't do it. <laughs> Yeah, it's not like I've ever heard anyone ever ask me about transmission issues on their uh, right. the GM vehicle or anything. Yeah. No, never. So, well, somehow, I don't know how, but my transmission fluid got bone dry low. And that's why I was having those weird revving issues. But it was working. Like, it didn't seize. Nothing well, happened. What did he bring up? The air filter, It everything still works. Yeah. It's just going to work. So much harder. Yeah. So I took it in and I knew that the transmission fluid needed to be flushed because it was dirty at the last oil change. And so I just made a mental note next time I'm in to get my oil changed, I'll budget some for the transmission fluid flush. <laughs> so they go to do the transmission fluid flush and they're trying to flush out all the the old fluid and they're not getting much out at all. And then the guy was like, were you aware that you were pretty low on transmission fluid or or what? And I was like, well, I knew it was dirty. I didn't know it was low. So, yeah, apparently the car was doing the weird That's crazy stuff. that it was that low and it still was able it to was, go down the road. It I mean, still went fine. I mean, it had a, some minor issues, but, like, yeah, I was able to drive on pretty low transmission fluid. I've actually had that happen quite a bit. Really? Low fluid will cause that. Huh. Um, and... uh People come and thinking they need a transmission, but really it's the fluid. And why your last oil change, they should have known that it was low. Why didn't they add? But it wasn't low. It was just So dirty. between two oil changes? Is, yeah. But where did it go? I We can't figure it out. I mean, where did it I'll go? I have to bring it to Dave so he can tell me. I mean, it doesn't just burn off. Typically, no. Um, I wouldn't expect it to just burn off the transmission fluid. Well, I mean, yeah. it's not like oil where you can burn some oil, right? Mm-hmm. But I did do a ton of driving in the hot summer. So that may have I mean, it, I it must have been the transmission ferry that took it away. Well, <laughs> since you mentioned the heat, if the car is driving and the transmission was overheating, the fluid can start going out. There's a vent on the top of the transmission. Oh. And it might have pushed down enough from the transmission that it's dropped the level. So it's possible that it overheated and caused that because yeah. of overworking during the heat. Yep, um, that would make sense. All right, I'll let you go on that one. Yeah, thanks. I uh, Hondas have a notorious for transmission issues, and um, I'll bring this last thing up, and then we'll go. I know I said we were done, and then I keep <laughs> and having you these kept ragging on Well, me. I got a mechanic here. I mean, yeah. like I have the opportunity to ask him anything. <laughs> so, it re- of course, they recommend the Honda transmission fluid. And I was like, okay, whatever. Well, I brought it and got it completely changed and they put not honda in it i had huge trouble with it it shifted terribly so i ended up doing a whole fluid change myself and putting it back in and i will never use anything but honda and i don't know what it is about hondas because usually you're like oh you can put mobile or whatever in but honda you have to put honda transmission fluid in and why is that what what is i mean i can't tell you exactly what was wrong with it but it was shifting hard it was not, I mean, I am very in tune to my car, not like Ben. And uh, it was shifting hard to the point where it was super noticeable and I changed it and it went back being fine. Why is that? Um, is any Honda guy you talk to, they're like, you do not put anything but Honda transmission fluid in there. I've had some luck with some other, certain other fluids in Honda, but they, Hondas are particular about their fluid. You cannot just go with any generic fluid. And I don't know why that is, but... Just a particular... Uh, because every fluid has its own uh, package of additives. And That's true. Everything. And combine that with the material of the uh, inside the transmission, the clutch packs that allow it to get the uh, power through it. Um, they just don't interact well, so it causes it to not shift properly. Or the seals don't perform quite the way they are supposed to because the rubber doesn't... For, um, 
flex the way it's supposed to, whatever the case may be. Mm. Um, I'm not an engineer to get a full detailed explanation <laughs> yeah. of it. But. Did you get that clutch packs? Yep. No, no idea what those are, but <laughs> getting over our head now. Yeah, I'm try- I try not to, but sometimes I do. No, no. It's all right. Yeah, we appreciate you coming um, to talk to us about this, um, especially for the people that don't pay a lot of attention to maintenance. Um, I'm going That's to. Me. Yeah, I've already beat you up enough. I'm going to let you I'm go. Gonna, you know, I'm going to send you that app. Oh, it might be iOS only, though. No. They were a little funny about that. Hmm. But it, it's it's great. I It tracks all my mileage. And every time I um, – uh, it, the reminders don't work very well for whatever reason, but every time I fill up, I go through my reminders. I'm like, oh, it even said, like, um, radiator fluid due in, like, 626 miles. So I'm kind of a stickler for that. But I want it to last forever. I don't want to – Get a new car. Yeah. They're expensive. They are. And I have a nice car and I want to keep it. Except it doesn't have a roof rack. Thought you were done ragging on me. No, check it. So he's got (laughs) the best car. He's got the Traverse, right? And it's got cooled seats, like high end, but doesn't have a roof rack. I saw a picture today. He has a Christmas tree inside his car. (laughs) I'm like, why don't you put it on the roof and strap it down like normal people? My car doesn't have a roof rack. It's got the slots, but that's so weird. I feel like you got gypped. Well, that's because of the fuel economy requirements for the government again. Oh, really? Yeah, fuel uh, roof racks do have a significant impact on fuel. Oh, economy, I'm sure. So you, I'm taking mine you, off. That, that's an option for, <laughs> you, for sure. Um, but anytime that it's not a standard feature, the manufacturer doesn't have to list that as impacting the fuel economy. Interesting. So if it's hmm. an optional feature, oh, that doesn't impact our fuel economy. That's after mar- That's an after addition from the customer. That's their problem. Oh. So they can keep a lower or a better rating from the government. Oh, so okay. So my car's more efficient. Oh, I'm sure it is. By um, like 0.5 miles a gallon yeah. probably. But I was just shocked because, because there's like three levels of car, like basic, mid-level. Like my pilot's a mid-level. I mean, it's got leather and everything, but it, it's not the touring edition. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Ben's got cooled seats. I don't know why I like that. that I mean, he's, <laughs> his car is like awesome, and he doesn't have a roof rack. I'm like, yeah. geez. Oh, well. There was a question in there. Well, I there saw is one last from question. Amber. Amber says, and I know this may be hard to know without seeing the car, but can yellow on your oil dipstick be from condensation in the engine and not something more major? I don't know what yellow would be on there. That's I'm confused on that, but I'm not a mechanic. I've never seen that. What I think she's probably talking about, there's a couple possibilities. One is if at some point there was an oil leak and someone put dye in it, ultraviolet dye, that can give it a green or yellow tint to it. Uh, in which case, that's no, no big deal. It's just some coloration to help find a leak that might be hard to otherwise pinpoint. The other possibility with that is um, I would consider it more of a brown or milky color. Okay. And that could indicate either condensation, which isn't a big deal, um, especially on a dipstick. That's pretty common. Hmm. Interesting. Or it could be um, that uh, coolant is getting into the oil, Mm. which would indicate potentially a head gasket or something more serious. But without seeing it, it would be impossible to say for sure which one it is. Yeah. Is that so something it, you could bring to a shop and just ask? Well, it's something that we'd have to do other testing to sure. determine where it's coming from. Okay. Um, and that's, it's one of the things you can eliminate things, but you can't say for sure that it's not yeah. a really problem. Yeah. Um, so you look at if there's any other symptoms. Are you going through coolant where the level isn't staying full? Are you um, having the engine not run properly? Is the engine overheating? Is the oil getting fuller than it should instead of staying at the full mark? Yeah. Um, those would be all things to look at to say maybe there's a, something else getting into it. Sure. Um, I had another question. Oh, as far as like my airbag recall, do I have to bring it to the dealer? Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. If I'm going to get it done for free. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's why I called them when I had the transmission. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to bring it to them, even though they charge a little bit more, and I would prefer to bring it to a private mechanic shop or mine. Um, I thought, you know what? I've got that airbag recall. I might as well get it fixed from Honda. So Now, if you've already had the work that's covered by recall done, a lot of times if you bring the receipt to Ford or Honda or whoever it may be, they will reimburse uh, partially at least, if not okay. full expense. Um, but there's always different uh, procedures for whatever the particular recall is. Yeah. Something to keep in mind, though, if you 
say a lot of uh, Chrysler vehicles have a problem with the ignition switch. So a lot of times that's been replaced, but then Chrysler will reimburse for the ignition switch if you had to pay for it at an independent it, shop. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah, I, d- I haven't had any recalls, but uh, I thought the airbag one, or I haven't had like ones I really, I don't know. This is, I think this is the first one, but the airbag one's probably pretty important. Yeah, pretty <laughs> common one too. A lot of different the airbag yeah. is common. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't even know what the problem was. I just saw, I saw recall airbag. I'm like, oh boy, I better get this. Yeah. Schedule. If it's the one I'm thinking of, it's because the supplier for Honda, uh, it's called Takata. Oh, it's it, this is the. the this was a huge story, mm-hmm. like like last year or the year before. Uh, a bunch of manufacturers have had problems with it. Okay, uh, I believe Ford has had some. Um, Chrysler has had a lot of them, and uh, Honda has some as well. So uh, I, I don't know all the full list of who has and has okay. not had Takata recalls, but there's a lot of them out there. Hmm. Are they still in business? <laughs> uh, last I knew, yes. Yeah. Oh boy. I can't imagine it's helping their profitability though. No. No. Anything else, Ben? Uh, well, based on one other comment that just came in from okay. Ted Lowey, it's not a not a question, but he says horrible bad drivers of rideshare on the road risking others and their lives. So maybe in the next episode we'll bring in a traffic cop or a no. We had trouble. We tried to get police officers yeah. involved and they didn't want nothing to do it. So maybe what is he saying that we're bad drivers? No, just oh. rideshare. There's horrible bad drivers of rideshare. Oh, yeah. They park in the middle of the street all yep. the time. Mm-hmm. And that's not a driving thing. That's a common sense Seriously. thing. Seriously. Oh, so. that frustrates me. I want to mow them down. <laughs> Pisses me off. So we I are hope. with you. And I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, Ted Lowey. Um, but we're with you. Yep. There are some horrible drivers. Our goal here at GR Rideshare is to educate so that we don't have those issues. Right. So. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us um, on this impromptu Saturday Night Live yeah, recording. With no producer, so I'm yeah. going to get up and stop the recording during the recording. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming out, David. Really appreciate it. So, again, Christian Brothers Automotive, stay tuned. GR residents for uh, details on potential rideshare driver saving.